attend, let us hear the Holy Gospel. Peace be to all. And to thy spirit. The reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to thee, O Lord. Glory to thee. Let us attend. At that time, Jesus entered Capernaum, and a centurion came forward to him, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home and in terrible distress. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion answered him, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I am a man under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say, Come to one, go, and he goes, and to another, Come, and he comes, and to my slave, Do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard him, he marveled and said to those who were following him, Truly I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and sit at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into outer darkness. Their men will weep and gnash their teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, be it done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Glory to thee, O Lord. Glory to In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Christ is in our midst. In today's Gospel lesson, we hear about a centurion, which means a Roman soldier whose faith in Christ was demonstrated consistent to his role as a military man and his personal conduct and character, the centurion's training, his discipline as a person who was under authority caused him to look to Christ with faith and expectation as his Lord and Master. In his own words, he said, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come to my house. It says, under my roof. Just say the word, and my servant will be healed. The Gospel records that Jesus was amazed at the man's faith. Now, there are numerous examples in the New Testament of the discipline of soldiers, also athletes. It was part of the world of first century Palestine. Today's lesson, however, demonstrates the power of the spoken word. The plea of the centurion to the Lord that was made on behalf of his servant, who in his day was very possibly his slave. In his request to the Lord, the centurion said, For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers, under me, I tell to one, go, and he goes. 
to another come, and he comes, and to my servant do this, and he does it. You heard it. The irony of the request is that the centurion was the master of his slave of whom he was pleading. Slavery, along with all kinds of behavior, was commonly practiced in the first century, some of which are not uncommon today. It included witchcraft, prostitution, homosexuality, political distortion, extortion. In fact, the New Testament provides evidence that some Christian converts were among those who were formally involved in the practice of this behavior. You heard it in St. Paul's epistle read from Romans this morning. The scripture speaks of it in terms of a spiritual bondage. Among the many established communities by the apostles, several converted from various religions and sinful lifestyles. And second, it cannot be overstated that for the believer to confess Jesus as Lord and to be baptized was a very, very serious thing. It was the sign of a radical transformation of one's life and was not taken lightly. For some, it meant martyrdom. Because to confess Jesus as Lord, contrary to Caesar, meant death. By the fourth century, conversions did not always occur rapidly. It took a long period of time, and many catechumens in the church prepared to, for holy baptism for a number of years, because the church was very concerned that there be no inconsistency to one's life and profession. In fact, there were some professions of which one was disqualified from being baptized. Many of the issues that the Christian church struggles in today's society with politicians and various kinds of public figures are precisely what the early church guarded itself against. In fact, during the early period of the church, baptism was postponed for many whose profession and way of life was not consistent with Christian teaching. In writing to the Romans, St. Paul says, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. He says, I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural cells, just as you used to offer parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness. So now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. Romans 6, 18-19. So the Apostle Paul personally spoke of himself in the same way. He begins his epistle to the Romans, which we've been spending time teaching the children. He begins in chapter 1 by saying, I, Paul, a slave, the Greek word doulos, or bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle who has been set apart for the gospel of God. In his epistle to Philemon, he says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. While the notion of being a slave or a prisoner sounds negative with the connotations 
of one's loss of freedom. Ironically, it was for Paul and the disciples the opposite. The early believers and followers of Jesus considered their Christian experience and identity as a liberation and a life of freedom from what was a very vain and debilitating life, a life that was self-centered and demoralizing. That freedom, however, was never understood as having a disregard or a disrespect for authority. Self-discipline, being under authority, therefore, were the key elements of the Christian way of life. For members of the armed forces today, the definition of self-discipline is doing what is right when no one is watching. It must also be said, however, that while self-discipline and being under authority are important to the life of a Christian, equally important is the fact that ultimately everyone is accountable to God's judgment. So um, allow me to ask a few questions. Who are you obedient to? What ways do you find yourself being obedient to others? Why is it important to you? Do you consider yourself a slave to those you are obedient to? Would your medical doctor or a therapist or a physical trainer be among those you are obedient to? <laughs> what about your financial or legal advisor? Or maybe your employer? Maybe your teacher or your coach? How is what you do in following their advice or instructions different, if at all, from the guidance that's provided by the church. What does being a Christian cost you today? What sacrifices do you make or have to make? For many of us, it begins with setting aside time to be in church. Hopefully, it includes much more. Our sacrifices begin with all that we do to maintain and preserve our lives as husbands, wives, or parents. It should also extend to those places where we spend our time at work, at school, or where we find fellowship and build relationships. We live in a time when few are held to be accountable for their actions. Choosing to practice the Christian way of life today, one might think, may not cost a person very much. Today, personal behavior can be explained as one being a victim of circumstances, genetics, or the system. The lines between right and wrong are marginalized. And all too often one's reasoning is that the ends justify the means. This happens when the foundational elements of Christian behavior and conduct are either diminishing or absent altogether. They are lacking when they are not reinforced and supported by an environment that educates and demonstrates its meaning. This is the greatest challenge for parents today. It's what makes our faith in Christ and our church membership a haven of salvation. What I call the eye of the storm. May our lives demonstrate the courage of our faith 
that bears the honest integrity of our holy tradition that lives as not a tradition that has died with the saints of the years past. Christ is in our midst.